Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino, the, the Big, Big Dinosaur, Dinosaur Podcast, Podcast, where we cover news, interviews, and discussions of all things dinosaur. Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today we'll be talking about Hypsilophodon, which was a request from our listener, Zach, as well as a bunch of dinosaur news. First in the news, there's an article that was published in the journal Current Biology titled, A New Horned Dinosaur Reveals Convergent Evolution in Cranial Ornamentation in Ceratopsidae. And that's kind of a mouthful, but basically it talks about two different groups of ceratopsians and how they're related, especially with this new find. The lead author was Caleb M. Brown, and with others, they describe this new horned dinosaur called Regaloceratops peterhewski. It's described based on a nearly complete skull, and it's the first of this species ever found, and also the first of that genus. The name comes from regal, which you probably know means royal, and it refers to the crown-shaped frill as well as the Royal Terrell Museum of Paleontology, and they specify this all in the paper And the fact that it's royal is because Queen Elizabeth II honored the museum with that title back in 1990. The species name is based on Peter Hughes, who discovered the holotype in the St. Mary River Formation in southern Alberta, Canada. Ceratopsians have one of the best preserved fossil records in Dinosauria, and because of this, we have a lot of detail on the different species and their different traits and how they evolved. I think we mentioned in an earlier episode, since their skull has so much bone on it, it would have been very difficult to try to eat or anything. So that may be why there's such a good fossilized record of them. Ceratopsidae is split into two groups. There's the Camosaurinae and the Centrosaurinae. So the Camosaurinae traditionally have a short nose horn and two long post-orbital horns, which are above the eyes. You can think of the Triceratops prorsus, which is like the one in Jurassic Park or The Land Before Time, or basically any depiction you've ever seen of a Triceratops in pop culture. And the Centrosaurinae have a longer nose horn and shorter horns above their eyes, which is the opposite of the way the Triceratops is set up. And there are some examples you might know if you're a dinosaur enthusiast, (laughs) but I'm not going to go into naming them. If you haven't seen a lot of different Ceratopsians, you may not have even ever seen one with this layout. Those two groups are useful because there are actually a lot of different Triceratops and Ceratopsian skulls that have been found, and they're actually really abundant considering the relatively short period of time they're around, but it indicates a lot of individual species and a lot of diversification amongst the group. In addition to these horn differences, the Centrosaurinae tend to show a lot of frill epiosification, and that's the ornamental fin or plate-like extensions from the top of the frill, so it looks like an ornamental edge along the top of the frill. The Camosaurinae, on the other hand, tend to have those large horns above their eyes and a larger frill, but the frill has less of that epiosification, so it doesn't look as ornate. The Centrosaurinae group went extinct a few million years before the mass crustaceous extinction, while the Camosaurinae group made it all the way up till the bitter end there. The really interesting thing is that this fossil seems to show that after the Centrosaurinae group went extinct, this particular species that was just discovered had some evolution that made it look a lot like one of those Centrosaurinae ceratopsians. Regaloceratops evolved from other Camosaurinae, but it has very short post-orbital horns and a long nose horn, which is the opposite that we usually see, and it has that big fancy frill that you don't usually see on the Camosaurinae. This is another example of convergent evolution and points to the fact that there was this gap for a couple million years where there weren't any Centrosaurinae looking long nose horn dinosaurs, so one of the Camosaurinae evolved to fill that niche relatively quickly. I mean, it's millions of years, but in the span of geological time, it didn't take that long. I want to point out that even though there were these two groups, the Camosaurinae and the Centrosaurinae, It wasn't as clean as they always had a long nose horn or always had long post-orbital horns and the other differences I mentioned. They kind of zigzagged along, but in general they held to those two groups. 
and this particular fossil is definitely the biggest jump from having those long post-orbital horns to having a long nose horn or vice versa. So it's a very interesting fossil. Next in the news we have a article published in the PLOS One journal by David J. Baraccio and some others titled Re-Identification of Avian Embryonic Remains from the Cretaceous of Mongolia. What they did in this study was they looked at some fossilized remains that were within an egg, so they were embryo remains, and they reclassified them from what they were originally interpreted as. These bones were originally described as a Neoceratopsian, but they're now proposing that they were from an early bird. They looked at a CT scan that was published online from the original research, and they basically decided that the egg was interpreted backwards, and what was thought to be a Ceratopsian humerus turned out to be a bird femur, and what they thought was a tibia turned into an ulna. <laughs> so legs were arms and everything was all backwards. After they reoriented the egg, the reason that they think that it was a bird is that the forelimb is significantly longer than the hind limbs in proportion, which makes sense if you have wings, you need really long forelimbs, but we've talked about a lot of dinosaurs don't tend to have that. Although if you looked at it backwards, you would think that the legs were a lot longer. The shape of the femur was indicative of a bird. It had a longer ulna than a humerus, which is also a bird trait. The size of the egg and the embryo is similar to a couple of other Mongolian bird eggs that have been discovered. And the specific orientation of the way that the animal limbs in the shell itself are lined up is indicative of theropods and other birds. I never realized that different animals were oriented in bones in different ways, but I guess so. The most interesting thing, though, might be that it's a three-layer eggshell, and when they originally published the paper saying that it was a Neoceratopsian, they thought that, well, I guess Neoceratopsians Neocer might also use three-layer eggshells, whereas they had only seen them in theropods and some birds before. But now they're saying, well, I guess we don't know about <laughs> ceratopsians again, but it kind of makes sense that it would stick to just theropods and some birds. So then there was also a uh, blog post published in the PLOS One blog titled The Curse of the Horned Dinosaur Egg by Andrew Fark. And he was actually an anonymous reviewer of the original paper that described the egg as a ceratopsian. And he says that he did have a little bit of doubt that it might have been another herbivorous dinosaur, but the thought of it being a bird never even remotely crossed his mind. <laughs> and based on the new evidence, he doesn't have really any doubt, and he pretty firmly believes that it's a bird based on this new evidence. He also notes that the peer review process might not be rigorous enough, because in this case it missed one. And he's definitely right about that, but... I kind of give them some slack because we did end up catching it. I mean, some other scientists got to look at the good documentation that was published for other scientists to look at, and that gives me a lot of faith in the process, even though it was published. And for a little while, we thought that that was a ceratopsian egg, you know, based on the transparency of the research, it did get corrected eventually. Fark also mentions that the bones are really difficult to distinguish when they're in an egg because... They get pretty jumbled up, and when you do a CT scan of a rock, it's really difficult to pick apart where one bone starts and another bone ends, or if there's a crack in a bone, or if that makes it two bones, and which end is supposed to be up because it's a round thing after all. He says there's a lot of art to it, and it really takes a careful eye and then a lot of interpretation to really figure out what's going on, which I thought was pretty interesting. He also mentions the original Overrafter discovery, and oviraptor means egg thief. And when it was originally discovered, the oviraptor was found next to a nest of eggs. And they thought that the oviraptor was going after a ceratopsian nest. So for a long period of time, we thought that those eggs were actually ceratopsian eggs and the oviraptor was trying to eat them. But many years later, we actually found out that the oviraptor was just guarding its own nest. And there were probably oviraptor eggs. So there have not been any Ceratopsian eggs identified anywhere yet. So it's still a total mystery what a Ceratopsian egg might look like and what an embryo looks like in the shell. Speaking of birds, scientists recently found a fossil of a bird with feathers that hails from the early Cretaceous, and it was found in Brazil, which was then Gondwana. 
The bird has not yet been named, but it's part of a group called Anentiornithes, and they had teeth, clawed wings, and probably no living descendants. This bird was the size of a hummingbird. It had big eyes, teeth, and its discovery may help show how feathers evolved. It looks like it was a juvenile, but it had a very developed tail, similar to modern adult birds in that it may have had color patterns to attract mates, but it also had a rachis-dominated tail, or a tail with ribbon-like feathers, which is not seen in modern birds. Before this discovery, this type of bird with the rachis-dominated tail had only been found in China and most fossils are preserved in two dimensions, so it was hard for scientists to know exactly what the tail feathers looked like. Some said that they might have been scaly, and others said they might have been more like, unique primitive feathers. The specimen found in Brazil is the most complete avian skeleton found from the early Cretaceous in Gondwana, and its feathers were well preserved, so now that may help show that the feathers, because of the signs of a color pattern on the tail feathers, feathers may have been used to attract mates. And if you want to read more, the study has, was published in the journal Nature Communications. Back to dinosaur-specific news. An article published in the PLOS One journal by Philip L. Manning, among others, titled A New Sauropod Dinosaur from the Middle Jurassic of the United Kingdom, describes a discovery in the Saltwick Formation. And this is actually the same place as the Stegosaurus tracks that we talked about last week. And we didn't mention it, but there are also sauropod tracks there, but until now, no sauropod bones had actually been uncovered at that site. That site is a Middle Jurassic formation, and that discovery would make it the oldest sauropod bone ever discovered in Britain. And there is an older dinosaur that may be considered a sauropod that was previously discovered called Camelotia, which means from Camelot, <laughs> because it was also discovered in what's now England. But... Its exact taxonomy is still being debated, and from what I can find, it appears that the current prevailing argument is that Camelotia is a prosauropod, and what a prosauropod means is that there are too many differences to make it a sauropod, but it is an old and related animal to a sauropod. If that decision changes later, then this Camelotia will become the oldest sauropod. But the bone that was discovered by the paleontologist that published this article has some specific unique features that are common to a specific group of eusauropods, and those are firmly classified in the sauropod group, so there isn't really any question that this one is a sauropod. It seems like it's probably a sauropod and not a prosauropod or some other sauropod-like animal, so it gets the title of oldest sauropod from England, at least for now. Cetiosaurus, meaning whale lizard, was previously the oldest known sauropod in England before this discovery, and the authors say that their sauropod is at least four million years older than the oldest Cetiosaurus known, which gave the headline, oldest British sauropod ever discovered. <laughs> it isn't even close to the oldest sauropod overall, though, there are many discoveries that date back to the late Triassic. For example, Antitonitris from South Africa, which is much, much older. And then we all know that there were titanosaurs that were much younger, so this one's basically just in the middle. But the authors point out that there have been relatively few discoveries of mid-Jurassic sauropods, so this find helps to fill in the picture of what they were like. Most of the well-known sauropods, Brachiosaurus, Apatosaurus, Brontosaurus, we're from the late Jurassic, so there's a lot of information about those, but the mid-Jurassic is relatively unknown. All of this information is coming from just one vertebrae, so they can't get too much information from it, and they didn't even name a new species or genus based on the bone. They're just calling it a sauropod bone because it's just not detailed enough. Luckily, it did have a few of those features that are specific to the eusauropod, so they know something about it, but just not enough to name it. Next in the news is kind of a funny little article titled, Enjoy Water? You're Drinking Dinosaur Pee. And it was actually published as a video, and it describes the statistics behind where water molecules have been in the past. Archimedes, <laughs> jumping to a totally different topic, Archimedes supposedly took a bath a long time ago, and he, while laying in the tub, discovered buoyancy. And he supposedly jumped out of the tub and yelled Eureka and ran through town because he had figured out how buoyancy works. 
When I was in college, we did a little exercise where we figured out how many molecules in a glass of water came from a bathtub, specifically Archimedes' bathtub. So if you say there's 50 gallons of water in the tub by the number of gallons in the world and all that, you can kind of estimate it. And it works out to be about six molecules in a glass, but there are a lot of molecules in a glass, so that's not very many. This article goes a lot more in-depth into it than a simple number of gallons divided by the total number of gallons on Earth. And part of that is because different areas of water exist on the planet. So there's the polar ice caps, there's the oceans, there's waters, there, or there's lakes, there's streams, and all this stuff. And water gets trapped in these different areas for long periods of time before it makes it over into another area. So the polar ice caps can hold water for thousands of years, and because of that, humans haven't really had enough time to go through all the water on Earth. If it takes tens of thousands of years to get out of the ice caps and humans have only had a really high population for a couple thousand years, we haven't really drank in all the water yet. But dinosaurs did. <laughs> because dinosaurs were around for such a long time and they drank so much water and ate so much plant life that was full of water, they almost certainly got through just about every molecule that is on Earth. Just playing devil's advocate, I feel like I have to point out a couple of little <laughs> side notes. So not all the water that's here now was around at the time of dinosaurs. Comets bring water in small amounts to the Earth, and then the water cycle isn't as simple as just water goes one place and goes another place. Water and carbon dioxide are combined to make sugar and oxygen in the plant photosynthesis cycle. So it's not the same water that a dinosaur had had because it's been turned back into oxygen. So it's really more accurate to say that you're drinking the same hydrogens and oxygens that were around back when dinosaurs were around. This idea actually inspired me to come up with a book about atoms. It's in the works right now, but it's basically about two atoms that meet at the beginning of the universe, and it's a, a quirky love story about their time together as the universe develops, and they spend a lot of time with dinosaurs. The idea that atoms are always around in one molecule or the other, but moving through the universe is pretty interesting, so thinking about where they've been and what they've been a part of inspired the story. And now that Jurassic World is almost out, we have to move on to our next dinosaur movie, <laughs> which in this case is the good dinosaur. I think last week I said I didn't know if there was a the or not, but it definitely has a the. They released a trailer for it, and it's really neat. We have a link to it on our website and in our show notes. I don't want to go too in-depth into describing the trailer, since this is just an audio podcast, but they show a lot of the different dinosaurs that are going to be in the movie, and the premise that the extinction-causing meteor or comet just barely missed the Earth instead of wiping out the dinosaurs, and then luckily humans managed to evolve so that they're existing at the same time. I did notice that one of the T-Rexes was a tripod T-Rex, in that it was standing upright using its tail, but... That's okay, because it's Pixar. So. <laughs> they get a break. Yeah, they get a break. <laughs> There's a new show about to pop up called T-Rex Autopsy, and <laughs> I don't really know what's going to be going on in it, but National Geographic launched Jurassic Week on Sunday, and they call it Jurassic Week. I'm not really sure why. Maybe just because Jurassic World's coming out on Thursday. But from what I can tell, the only days that have any dinosaur-themed anything are Sunday and Thursday when Jurassic World comes out. So I guess that makes it a week. I was thinking a shark week where it's like nonstop, but whatever. So this show is supposed to be about them dissecting a somehow preserved 43 foot long T-Rex and the different experts that they have there. The trailer looked pretty cool because they actually made this huge dinosaur. And then they actually did a publicity stunt in London where they drove it around on the back of a flatbed truck going by Trafalgar Square, the House of Parliament, London Bridge, and Buckingham Palace. So there are all these pictures all over the internet of this weird dinosaur under a sheet <laughs> uh, on the back of a truck. So if you're listening to this, that means you probably don't have time to queue up your DVR for Sunday, since this probably won't be released till Monday or Tuesday. But you should be able to catch it all on Thursday. It looks like they're re-airing most of that stuff. And last but not least, there's a Reddit article. If you've noticed a trend, they tend to get less serious as we go through the news. <laughs> Start with peer review and end with Reddit. 
but some people on Reddit posted at London's Waterloo station, there's a container in the middle of the station that's labeled predatory livestock, and it actually made it all the way to the front page of Reddit. So clearly the marketing stunt is working really well for Jurassic World and the marketing team there. It's about the size of the crate from the opening scene in the original Jurassic Park movie where the quote-unquote raptor attacked everybody. And the crate in the station is labeled all over it with in-gen technologies and various danger signs. Uh, It made me wonder if it's an actual prop from the movie that they just decided to repurpose as an advertising gimmick or if they made it specifically for this event or for this uh, installation. But it's definitely keeping people's mind on Jurassic World. We're going to see it on Thursday. (laughs) That wraps up our news for this episode. So now on to the dinosaur of the day, Hypsilophodon, which again is a request from our listener Zach. So thanks, Zach. Hypsilophodon is an ornithopod, and its name means Hypsilophus tooth. It lived in the early Cretaceous in what's now England, and the type species is Hypsilophodon foxy, named between 1869 to 70, depending on who you ask. It was found in the Wessex Formation in the Isle of Wight, and there have been a lot of fossils found on the Isle of Wight. Almost 100 specimens of Hypsilophodon have been found there and over 20 dinosaur species have been found there. 20 Hypsilophodon specimens were found in one place where they died together, and scientists think it may have been from quicksand. The type species name comes from Reverend William Fox, who discovered the 1868 specimen with a skull. Before that, Hypsilophodon bones had been found, but no skull. Hypsilophodon was small bipedal, about 5.9 feet or 1.8 meters long, and weighed about 45 pounds or 20 kilograms. It was an agile runner and had a sharp beak that it used to bite off vegetation. It was an herbivore, but also possibly an omnivore. What's interesting about Hypsilophodon is how many misconceptions there have been of the dinosaur. So, for example, scientists used to think that Hypsilophodon climbed trees and was armored. It was first found in 1849, again, without the skull. Two pieces were sold, one to the naturalist James Scott Bowerbank, and at the time they thought that the Hypsilophodon bones were actually the bones of a young iguanodon. One man named Mantell described it as an iguanodon in 1849, and Richard Owen also described it as an iguanodon in 1855. But then in 1870, the paleontologist Thomas Henry Huxley wrote a more comprehensive description after he was able to study the skull that the Reverend William Fox had found. Huxley was the first to note that ornithischians had pubic bones that pointed backwards like birds. And he chose the name Hypsilophodon because he wanted it to be similar to the Iguanodon's name, which means iguana tooth. So he chose to name the dinosaur after an extant herbivorous lizard. Richard Owen, however, still thought that Hypsilophodon was not a different genus, and he renamed it in 1874 Iguanodon foxy. But scientists rejected that. And another person, John Whitaker Hulk, was able to study more specimens from fox and further rejected Richard Owen's renaming to Iguanodon Foxy. So it's going to be a little jumping back and forth between years here because a lot of different things happened, but in 1874, Hulk described Hypsilophodon as armored. In 2008, paleontologist Galton wrote that the armor was actually from the torso and, quote, an example of internal intercostal plates associated with the rib cage. It consists of thin mineralized circular plates growing from the back end of the middle rib shaft and overlapping the front edge of the subsequent rib, end quote. So that's the story of how scientists no longer think that Hypsilophodon was armored. But in 1882, Hulk also said that Hypsilophodon was probably quadrupedal and he climbed rocks and trees because it had a grasping hand. In 1912, the paleontologist Athenio Abel said that it was an arboreal animal, and in 1916, Gerard Heilman said that it lived like a modern tree kangaroo. But in 1926, Heilman changed his mind and said the first toe was not opposable because it was, quote, firmly connected to the second, so it couldn't have climbed in trees easily. But in 1927, Athenio Abel denied this description, and in 1936, a paleontologist named Swinton said that even though the first metatarsal was forward-pointing, it might have had a movable toe. It wasn't until 1969 when Peter M. Galton analyzed the skeleton, and again, Galton is the one who determined that Hypsilophodon did not have armor. 
he described Hypsilophodon as not being able to climb, but instead being a bipedal runner. So to sum up, originally Hypsilophodon went through many stages of description, but at one time it was considered quadrupedal on four legs, living in trees like a modern kangaroo and having armor. But now we think that it did not have armor, it was bipedal, and that it was a very agile runner. Most of the Hypsilophodon specimens that have been studied were found between 1849 and 1922, and they're now housed in the Natural History Museum in London, at least about 20 of them. If you want to see a Hypsilophodon, there's some on display in the Natural History Museum in London. So again, Peter Malcolm Galton, he published his thesis on Hypsilophodon in the 1960s, which started modern research on this dinosaur. For a brief period in 1978 to 1979, Galton and James Jensen, who you may remember from our episode on Ultrasaurus, named another Hypsilophodon species called Hypsilophodon wylandi after George Reber Weiland found a thigh bone in South Dakota. They thought that this species was proof of a land bridge between North America and Europe, but now the specimen is considered an indeterminate basal ornithopod. Interestingly, even though Hypsilophodon lived in the Cretaceous, it had primitive features such as five digits on each hand and four digits on each foot, and its fifth finger was opposable and could grab food. It had a beak like other ornithischians, but it also had five teeth in its premaxilla, which is the front of the upper jaw. And most herbivores in this time no longer had these front teeth. They were more specialized. Hypsilophodon had a large eye socket, thin pointy bones over the top half of its eyes to give it shade and also make it look fierce. It had a short, large skull with a triangular snout and a beak. And this beak-like mouth means that it may have been choosy about what it ate. It had 28 to 30 teeth that were fan-shaped and it continually replaced its teeth. It may have had cheeks to help chew its food, And because it was so small, it ate low-growing plants, probably like shoots and roots. They also probably moved in large groups, and because of these things, Hypsilophodon has been dubbed the deer of the Mesozoic. They may have been semi-quadrupedal when eating low-growing plants, and they may have eaten seeds, like cicads and cone-like seed plants, but not much is known about its habitat. Possible predators include Eotyrannus, Neovenator, and Baryonyx, and no Hypsilophodon nests have been found, but related species have been found with neatly arranged nests, so Hypsilophodon may have cared for their eggs before hatching. Hypsilophodon was one of the fastest types of dinosaur, probably. It had a body built for running, it was lightweight, had long legs, a stiff tail for balance, and it may have been the best ornithischian adapted to running. When running, it kept its spine horizontally level to the ground, so its long tail would have helped it counterbalance. In addition to the Natural History Museum in London, you can also see a mounted skeleton of Hypsilophodon at Dinosaur Isle, which is Britain's first purpose-built dinosaur museum and visitor attraction based on the Isle of Wight, according to their website. Hypsilophodon is part of the family Hypsilophodonts, and they were small, long bipedal herbivores. Some made burrows for their young, like Erectodromius, and we talk about Erectodromius actually in episode 2, when we interviewed Dr. Anthony J. Martin, who discovered the burrow. Hypsilophodons lived in the Middle Jurassic to Late Cretaceous, and fossils have been found in Asia, Australia, Europe, New Zealand, North America, and South America. Our fun fact of the day is that all dinosaurs laid eggs, which you probably already know, but there are about 40 kinds of dinosaur eggs that have been discovered so far, even though we know there are about a 1,000 dinosaur species that have been discovered so far. So that means there are still a lot of unknowns when it comes to the dinosaur eggs, including ceratopsians, like we discussed earlier. So again, Jurassic World comes out this week. Garrett and I are going to see it, and if you're planning on seeing it, I hope you have had a chance to buy tickets already. I think it might be selling out pretty fast. But to celebrate, we're releasing three dinosaur books over the course of this week and the next few weeks. One is an epic fantasy, if you like Game of Thrones. It's the first book in a series called Dinosaur Wars, about anthropomorphic dinosaurs living in the late Jurassic period. If you like Apatosaurus and Allosaurus, then you are in for a treat. The other book is called The Top 10 Dinosaurs of 2014, and it's focusing on 10 of the biggest dinosaur discoveries of last year. We've gone over most of them in our podcast, and that was actually inspiration for this book, except it's in addition to learning facts about the dinosaurs, it's imagining fictitious scenes of how the dinosaurs lived and behaved, and most of them have pictures. So some of the dinosaurs featured include Anzu Wiley, Changi Raptor Yangi, Dreadnoughtus, 
Changesaurus, and Spinosaurus. And lastly, we have a children's book called What Happened to Brontosaurus, because, as we know, Brontosaurus is now back, but after 100 years of being classified as an Apatosaurus. So this book has been in the works for about a year and a half, and originally started off as Brontosaurus does not exist, but then, of course, we had to change it with the recent news. Uh, good thing it's an ebook, so it's easy to change. The illustrations are by Andrea Gaggi, who is a fantastic illustrator, so if you're looking for something fun to read with kids or even just for yourself, you should check it out. If you sign up for our mailing list at inodino.com between now and June 19th, we'll send you a form so you can get free copies of the three books when they become available. Thanks for listening, and until next time. Thank you for listening to I Know Dino. If you have any questions or comments about dinosaurs, we'd like to hear from you at plesiosaur at inodino.com. And for more information on dinosaurs, go to inodino.com or follow us on Google, Facebook, Tumblr, or Twitter at I Know Dino.